What is a weird fact you know about nuclear bombs? 54% of the U.S.'s deterrent nuclear weapons are on board nuclear-powered submarines capable of prowling the ocean for 70 days at a time, their exact locations known only to their crews. Their mission is to remain hidden so as to assure second strike retaliatory capability, edit, of course these subs can go more than 70 days deployed, they're nuclear, they are typically commissioned with enough uranium to power them for 20 to 30 years. They can be resupplied at sea for various crew requirements. And 100% of the UK's nuclear weapons are on submarines. We have four subs in total. As an addition to this, each British Trident submarine has a safe on board, which should the captain determine that London and the government have been destroyed, they'd open. In the safe is a letter from the Prime Minister of the time with instructions for the captain as to what to do next. This could include anything from launch a retaliatory strike, join a friendly nation's navy or use their own discretion. When a PM leaves office, these letters are destroyed without opening and replaced with the new PM's instructions. 1. The first one, or maybe the first two, were referred to simply as the gadget dot, to an underground nuclear bomb test is thought by some to be responsible for the fastest moving man-made object in history, a manhole cover. It was used to cover the hole down which the bomb was lowered, and a high-speed camera was trained on it because there was the expectation that it would bugger off very quickly. The camera captured only one frame with the lid in it post-explosion. Calculations are very rough, but if accurate, the lid far exceeded escape velocity, reaching a speed higher than even any spacecraft or probe yet launched, and if it survived intact it will right now be whizzing through space at a ridiculous pace. Before the first one was detonated, there was some concern that runaway nuclear fission reactions would continue as a result of the bomb, until the Earth's atmosphere was destroyed completely. This was found to be unlikely before the first bomb was tested. During the Cold War, 32 nuclear weapons were lost due to accidents, six of which were never recovered, edit, I should have added this is for the United States alone. No one can solidly determine if or how many the Soviets lost. There was a nuclear missile treaty that a technician describes as it's like you have a Volkswagen in your garage. You can never drive it, but you can periodically disassemble it, examine every part, perform maintenance on the parts, ensure that each individual part works as intended, then reassemble it, but you can never start the engine, and you definitely can't drive it, there's also a website where you can superimpose a nuclear blast over various cities. Helps give perspective on the scale of the blast. Isn't there a thing about not being able to carbon date things after 1950 for the same reason, not quite we actually benefit from nuclear testing in this one weird way. The amount of carbon-14, C-12 and C-13 are stable, but 14 is not, in the atmosphere has always been relatively stable. After the barrage of nuclear testing throughout the 50s the amount of C-14 spiked dramatically. We observed that every 11 years the amount of C-14 would drop closer to the baseline. We can see that in a few decades the planet will return to its previous baseline level of C-14, so long as more detonations don't happen, dot, that's led to an interesting phenomena where for the past few decades we've been able to use this for interesting observations. For example, all trees across the planet that were alive prior to this period of nuclear testing show a spike in their rings that correlates with this testing. We can use this spike to determine how long the tree has lived by comparing the amount of rings before and after this spike. Another example is looking at tissue turnover. How long does a tissue exist, and how quickly is the turnover slash replacement of these tissues? Well we can see how much C14 they possess and look at how much this changes over time. From there you just note the amount of change in C14 to the amount of time, and you get a turnover rate. The thing is that we only have a few more decades of this technique. Once the planet returns to the baseline we won't be able to use it anymore. Source, ecologist who has worked with botanists that explained the process to me. Also had to calculate half-life in undergrad and we used C14 because it was relevant. Once the chain reaction with the uranium is initiated, neutrons bounce around inside the device triggering more atoms to release their energy. Early designs exploded before much of the nuclear material had even been triggered, leading to wasted uranium and smaller explosions. The most effective designs contain this chain reaction for as long as possible like a pressure cooker to maximize the size of the explosion, edit, evidently neutrons, not atoms, continue the chain reaction. Guess I'm not a nuclear physicist. Operation Crossroads after the iconic Baker shot, Bikini Lagoon was heavily irradiated, as the bomb was detonated underwater. To show how irradiated the water was, Army General Stafford Warren caught a fish from the lagoon and used it to expose an X-ray image of itself on a piece of film. The fish experiment and subsequent scientific instrument readings of the radiation led to the eventual cancellation of the third planned test that was supposed to happen. Edits to fix information. Thanks have a brain so use it in commercial underscore Kiwi 2741 for clarification. After a nuclear war the ozone layer would be burnt off and would take 3 to 10 years to recover. 
so if you go outside you'll get a killer sunburn and possibly blindness and much higher chance of skin cancer. Stay covered up and wear good sunglasses I guess. Oh boy this question was made for me. I love studying the technology behind nuclear bombs. Here are a few fun facts, the energy released from fission and fusion bombs are exponential. If you can keep the materials together for one billionth of a second longer, you'll have 50% more yield. At some point it's just easier to pad the bomb with anything heavy, like lead or more uranium, the bomb design that was dropped on Hiroshima was never tested. The first nuclear bomb detonated was the design that was dropped on Nagasaki. The plutonium that is used in fission bombs have to be manufactured, there is no plutonium or that can be found on Earth. This is done with a breeder reactor, photos of the first ever nuclear detonation show a fireball in the shape of a sphere with long spindles like tentacles coming off of it. Those spindles are the tower steel wires being vaporized by the amount of X-rays emitted from the bomb. Detonation of a nuclear bomb is closely followed by rain, as the heat from the bomb pulls moisture into the upper atmosphere where it cools then rains. Do not drink the rain. Most immediate radiation's deaths from Hiroshima are from people drinking the rain in a desperate attempt to get water. Britain's nuclear warheads are moved between Fos Lane Naval Base and the Atomic Weapons Establishment in Aldermaston in big green articulated lorries in convoys. A convoy contains between two and five lorries, they are accompanied by mod police and royal marines both covertly and overtly, a breakdown lorry, a rolling command center that looks like a passenger coach, and a variety of other stuff. Each lorry has a driver and a royal marine, both armed. Each convoy contains at least one decoy, empty, lorry. The lorry cabs can only be opened from the inside or from outside with a code. The cabs are made by Mercedes-Benz trucks, but they carry no badges as MB don't want to be associated with the weapons. With a warhead on board and all the associated shielding, the lorries are far heavier than is normally legally permitted. And the axle configurations are technically illegal, but the whole thing is run under crown prerogative by the mod. This also exempts them from the need for tachographs, driver's hours regulations, and the need for speed limiters. That thermonuclear devices consist of a primary fission in the 5 kT range that starts fusion in the secondary by means of focusing the X-ray burst into heating the secondary material. The shape of the X-ray lens is classified, and if you were a physics student and you wrote a paper describing how to do it, it instantly became classified as well. In 1961 a Boeing B-52 Stratofortress carrying two Mark 39 3-4 megaton nuclear bombs broke apart while flying near Goldsboro, North Carolina. One of the two nuclear bombs came really came close to detonate as somehow three out of four triggering mechanisms were triggered when they found the bomb. I thought the exact same thing, one of my favorite stories is how the material and design for the hydrogen bomb interstage was so highly classified that the United States temporarily lost institutional knowledge of how to produce it. I don't remember if the details were split between several contractors or if it was a single contractor who had split the details between several employees so that no one employee knew the full details of how it was done. But eventually the relevant part of the nuclear arsenal had reached its end of life and needed to be refurbished, and it turned out nobody knew how to do it anymore. They'd lost key information on how it worked or how to build it, so they had to relearn. And apparently it cost a lot more money and took considerably longer the second time than it had the first time. Even though they knew it could be done, if I have time, later tonight I'll try to find a source for this. I'm sure I'm messing up lots of the details. The reason mushroom clouds are as prevalent as they are in Spongebob is because Bikini Bottom is the seabed under Bikini Atoll, the site of the Operation Crossroads nuclear tests. It's also a bit of a tourist attraction and the ships there, which include IJN Nagato and USS Saratoga, are diveable wrecks. On a secondary note, water does a very good job of containing radiation. If there is a direct nuclear impact called for your location, a bunker is useless. Depending on the load, a bunker is only useful for those in the fallout zone, not the direct impact zone. Also radiation is carried on the wind which is what creates such a large fallout zone, but it settles in the soil which is what restricts people to the bunkers for such a long time, edit, oh and also even when you can safely come to the surface, you can't eat any food grown from that soil or drink any water from the surface. The radiation that sticks around the longest can't penetrate human skin, but it's a different story if you ingest it. Any crops grown above ground would be contaminated. I can't remember how long it sticks around off the top of my head. Back when the UK nuclear weapons program hadn't quite figured out the whole hydrogen bomb thing, weapons designers came up with an interim solution by building a really really big atom bomb that didn't use any hydrogen. Just a crap ton of uranium, while it's perfectly possible to make an atom bomb as powerful as a small hydrogen bomb, it wasn't done very much during the Cold War because it's super duper dangerous and expensive. Nevertheless they really wanted a big bomb so they went ahead anyway, so the danger was that the 70 kilogram hollow ball of uranium inside the bomb was highly unstable and could get dented or flattened in an accident, which would have made it explode. 
Normal atom bombs have a much smaller mass of uranium which is much harder to explode accidentally. The solution was to fill the hollow ball with steel balls. 133,000 of them. The bomb was armed by pulling a plug and pouring the balls into a tub, then made safe by pouring them back in. On one occasion the plug fell out of one of the bombs and the hangar floor where it was stored became covered with 133,000 steel balls and a single 400 kiloton grumpy atom bomb. The bomb was not popular with British pilots. Eventually Britain figured out how to build hydrogen bombs and the green grass bomb was quickly retired. Britain also built a chicken-powered nuclear landmine. But that's a different story. If you live in a city with a major university, military base, manufacturing hub or major economic structure, there is already a nuke aimed at you right now. The nuke is also von Neumann architecture. Just like everything else, the explosion of a hydrogen bomb is actually two nuclear bombs in one, and requires that enough radiation from the explosion of the first bomb actually reaches the second bomb to ignite it before the blast does and destroys it. The tolerances are insane. During one of the first nuclear test explosions at Los Alamos, a young Richard Feynman was enthusiastically playing his bongos as the bomb went off. It's a trippy mental picture. When people say thermonuclear war would end life on Earth, they aren't necessarily referring to the explosions themselves. In the event of nuclear winter, there would be no sunlight for one to two years. Nearly every plant on the surface would die, as would nearly every animal shortly thereafter as the food chain collapsed. Whole forests would become dead wood and fuel massive fires the moment lightning started hitting. The smoke and ash from the world's collective forests burning would extend nuclear winter by years, while also consuming massive amounts of oxygen with no plant life left to replenish it. Deep undersea life or cave organisms would be the only thing left to enjoy the poisonous atmosphere of our irradiated wasteland. It would be a waking nightmare. It's probably already been mentioned, but I'm not sifting through 2,400 comments to see if it has. But launching a nuclear bomb at least in the USA isn't as easy the president pushing a simple button or making a general order to do so. In the event that we launch a nuclear weapon in a direct attack against another country the president gives the initial command which is then passed down through several levels of military clearance before eventually reaching the actual silo that is to launch the ICBM containing the warhead and even then it will have to go through a two-key process system before it goes live and can be launched. Much of the precautions were put in place because back in the 70s former president Richard Nixon got drunk and attempted to launch a nuclear attack on North Korea, to which the VP at the time halted the situation telling everyone involved to let him sleep it off. Since then we take a lot more precautions when it comes to launching nuclear weapons. I just did some math, the largest nuclear weapon in the active US arsenal is the B-83, with a yield of 1.2 megatons. According to its description, it would disintegrate anything in a 1.04 kilometers radius, moderately damage buildings slash kill most individuals within 7.47 kilometers, and cause third-degree burns to anyone outside within 13.2 kilometers. At the peak of the Cold War, there were about 70,300 nuclear devices of various yields. If we assume that all those nukes are B-83s, and overestimate, and that everything inside the thermal radiation radius of 13.2 kilometers is completely destroyed, also an overestimate, and that all the devices detonated with no overlap, then the total land area destroyed would be nearly 38.5 million square kilometers, or 25.6% of the land area of the Earth, or 7.5% of the total surface area, today, there are only 13,890, still too many, nuclear devices. With the same assumptions, would destroy a mere 5.1% of land area, or 1.5% of total surface area, even if we assume all the bombs were the 50 megaton Tsar Bomba, the biggest bomb ever tested. The current inventory of 13,890 bombs would only just destroy all the land area of the Earth, 104.7% of land area, only 30% of the total surface area.